it was about three days when you found out the house was fine. Mm -hmm. And then once you were able to, you know, kind of get in there and really investigate and find out, oh, there's not even smoke damage or anything like that. Um, what kind of a relief did you feel? <laughs> well, I don't cry often, but I had a few tears in my eyes when we finally got up there. Um, to my wife's credit, she designed the house with a tile roof, which I learned later is a must for any area that's in any kind of fire danger ever, so the roof doesn't burn. Um, we've been religious about keeping the oak trees hacked back from the house. Um, our caretaker keeps the grounds around the house down at dirt level all summer long. So there were people wiser than I who were sort of keeping an eye on us through this whole, through this whole ordeal. So those things, and then I learned later not having windows open with curtains that were dangling and could catch fire. The house was basically closed up, which helped. Um, nor did our deck catch on fire. So the, the fire, because of the winds, the 25 or 30 mile an hour winds, blew the fire basically around our house. And you could very clearly see it. When I finally got up there, you could see the char marks right up to within a couple of feet of the house. And it just roared right around it. Uh, I, I was floored. I, I mean, I just, I, I had no words to, to <laughs> explain what had just happened. There wasn't a smudge mark on the house. There wasn't, there was a little bit of smoke smell inside the house, but no damage, nothing. Nothing was damaged except for the barn. We were one of the few structures that actually, that actually got destroyed. And you had neighbors, you told me, that actually, that you hadn't even met or you didn't know that were, you found out later, had come over and they were already hosing things down and stuff before you got out there? This just further endeared me to the people of, of Mosier and, and I'm guessing throughout the gorge. Um, it's a fairly rural environment, so help can be a long time in coming. I found out later that several of our neighbors had gotten wind of the fire, had raced up there and turned on hoses and hosed things down around the house. So that, again, added to sort of, you know, the good luck that, that came to that place. Uh, and I met them later and we've all become sort of friends because of that. So I sort of understand this, this mentality of, of rural living more so than I ever have before. I, I'm, I'm a Portland guy, big city, lots of neighbors. I don't even know most of my neighbors. Yeah. In Mosier, I, I think I know all my neighbors now. Yeah. Did you guys all get together after, after this was all done and sort of like, hey, we did it. We did. We made it. We did. About a month later, I think, we, uh, we just called everybody, emailed everybody, went knocking on doors and said, hey, we're going to have a big party Saturday night. Come on up. So people that uh, ordinarily aren't group people, you know, they don't like hanging out in big groups, showed up. And I think it was just that common sense of, like you said, we made it. We got through it somehow. Nobody got hurt. You know, we lost some stuff. We're okay. So uh, that even further, you know, endeared me to the neighborhood and uh, the, these new friends that we've made. Yeah. Well, tell me about writing about it, because you did write for Columbia Gorge Magazine. Did you write? Have you written about it for anything else, or was that your the one that everybody actually really saw? John, I had not written about it. Um, I'm sort of an inveterate note taker anyway. I think just because of my profession. So regardless of what I'm doing, even on vacation, I'll spend a couple hours a day taking notes. Um, so I did take a few notes just for my own benefit so I could remember later the things that had transpired in sort of some sort of timeline form. So I had notes. Um, I actually saved some of the voicemails that I called into my wife before she came out that Sunday, um, just again to sort of keep a record of what was happening. So well, I was those feeling, hard uh, to listen to? Um, not so much now. Um, yeah, within the first few months, they were kind of hard. Pretty raw, you could, yeah. you could hear the agitation in my voice and the excitement and, the, and the, uh, just the sheer energy of, of everything that was going on. Yeah. Um, but then, I guess, you know, six or eight months later, in talking with your editor, Matt, um, I said, would you be interested in a story on the fire? He said, as luck would have it, we have a, sh a shooter who shot some pretty amazing photographs. Yeah, let's give it a go. So that was the first time I really sat down to think about writing about it. And it was probably the most difficult piece I've ever written. Really? Because I was so close to the story, um, I didn't know where to jump in. I didn't know how much detail to give people. I didn't know how much of my emotion I should give readers, uh, how much factual information. So uh, I just decided to leap in. I, I wrote it from from the, those couple hours after I'd been up to the house and, and seen the barn go and watched this, this wall of flame just roll across the mountaintop. Uh, I started there and wrote it in first person present time. It's like, I just wanted the reader to be there with me. Um, and then sort of went back and explained what had happened. Um, I was able, after 
the fire to actually go back and do some in-depth interviews with with Jim Appleton, the Mosier Fire Chief, and Roland Rose from the U.S. Forest Service, and various other people to get their perspective on what was happening. Um, my mind was certainly calmer than than the night of the of the fire, I'm where sure. I was not thinking terribly clearly. Right. So I was able to actually, you know, contemplate on it a little bit and talk to these people in a thoughtful way, where I learned, you know, that we had done the right things to to protect the home. Um, what sort of triage they go through to evaluate a fire. Uh, basically, our house had the big red X in the driveway. It's like, it's too far gone. We're going to move on and try and save homes further down the line. Um, did you know that? No. You didn't? No, I did you not. You found that. that out later. What I also found out later was um, I had Jim Appleton, the Mosier Fire Chief, up to the house. We're sitting in the kitchen at the table, and he said, I spent the entire night here, you know, protecting your house. Roland Rose said, stay here. He had his brush truck with him, which had a couple of hundred gallons of water. He actually called in a brush crew at one point because the fire had circled back around and was coming up the, the gorge side of the canyon. Um, so he called in a brush truck to get rid of a couple of trees that could have endangered our house, and uh, he spent the whole night there. And that's when he explained to me how they do these things. So I was just amazed by this. So that, of course, factored into the story. Yeah. I had time to talk to Roland Rose and learn the hierarchy of authority and how it changes hands throughout an event like that. And we're talking a matter of, you know, 72 hours. It went from, you know, Jim Appleton and Bob Palmer to the state level. And they were bringing in crews from all over the state and, and tanker planes from Redmond and helicopters and fire crews. So when I finally got to drive back up there, um, I was basically stopping and kissing the boots of every firefighter I saw and just said, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for what you did. Yeah. Because um, they were an amazing bunch of guys. I mean, firefighters, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to talk to them, but they're, they're a breed apart. They, they do this for whatever reasons they do this, and they're amazingly devoted. So when all was said and done, I, yeah, I had the, a, a pile of amazing components for a story. Um, but when I turned the story into Matt, my editor, I said, Matt, I don't know if I got this. I just, I'm too close to it. I don't know. I just don't know if this is, if this gets it for you. You know, if you need changes, come back to me and let me know. And I think he talked to me a day or two later and said, no, nah, it's fine. He said, it's absolutely fine. We have Jock's photos, your, your words. said, this is one of the nicer pieces we've done. Yeah. So it worked out fine. I, and I, I hope people got yeah, something well, out of it. Obviously, I read it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. And uh, it, was, it was really well done. Thank and, you. And, uh, Thank you. you. You did a really good job of showing the emotion around the event, but yet still allowing people to sort of formulate that for themselves. So it was, it was a well done piece. I hoped, you know, at, at the end of the day that people would at least read it and go, oh yeah, maybe I should, you know, clean up the wood pile from my house or get rid of the, you know, right. whatever detritus is yeah, in my front yard. Yeah, because none of us want to think about that Nobody sort of does. Thing, you know, no. and, and we always think it won't happen to us. Well, and you know, and there but for the grace, you know, we did a couple of things right and, and it went well. Yeah, yeah. It was well, so we talked a little bit about writing for Columbia Gorge Magazine, mm -hmm. but writing is what you do. Writing is what I do. Writing is your thing. And um, I want to talk to you when we come back from the break about has it always been that way? And where did this writing background come from? And um, you've obviously been pretty successful at it. So um, knock on wood, right? So we'll, uh, we'll discuss that when we come back, you guys. We'll be right back. Coming up. The lure of playing live music was too great, so I started playing professionally. And that took me through about the end of the 80s. 